Good evening. I'd like to call to order the business meeting of the Portland Board of Public Education. It is Tuesday, October 18th, and we are meeting in a blended format with some of us here at Casco Bay High School and others joining us via Zoom. Mr. Superintendent, will you please call the roll? Uh, yes, Chair. Ms. Bondo? Présente. Mr. Burke? Here. Ms. Russell Better? Ms. Billyu? Ms. Bryden? Here. Mr. Youssef? Ms. Lentz? Here. Mr. Grant? Here. Ms. Aslami? Ms. Ellis? Mr. McLaughlin? Mr. Alzamili? Ms. Santiago? Ms. Diu? Here. And Chair Figdor? Here. I know Mr. Youssef is um, traveling outside the country today and trying to join us. And then Ms. Billyu is sick tonight and not able to join us. I would like to invite you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Portland Public Schools recognizes the original inhabitants of the land on which our city and schools stand. The Woolis to Eig, or Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Penobscot, and Pascamaquoddy tribes, known collectively as the Wabanaki Confederacy, or people of the Dawn Land. We are honored to have Wabanaki children among our students today, and as a district, we are committed to making the past, present, and future of Wabanaki peoples visible in our schools and classrooms. As is customary, we're starting tonight's business meeting with a public comment uh, with public comment on any issue that we're not voting on tonight. So if any members of the public would like to address the school board, you have three minutes. You can come forward um, and tell us start by telling us your name and where you live. And um, for those of you on Zoom, you can use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. And if there are people both on Zoom and in the room who want to speak, I will try and alternate between the two. So anyone who would like to speak to the board, um, please come forward and you have three minutes. Hello, my name is Mackenzie Smith and I'm a freshman at Deering High School. Hello, my name is Michaela Smith and I'm a freshman at Portland High School. We are twins. We both play for the JV volleyball teams. This policy made it so we can't watch each other's games. It has divided our family. We also have a brother who plays football on the JV and varsity teams at Deeren. Another sister who is on the varsity volleyball team at Portland High School. I can go to our brother's games. I can't. I can go to my older sister's games. I can't. Please withdraw this policy or change it so we can attend games with our parents or grandparents. Make it like Casco Bay. Stop dividing our family. Thank you so much. I pre really appreciate your being here tonight. Okay, I don't see any hands up on Zoom, so you please come forward, introduce yourself, and you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Mary Dorazio. Um, I live on Orkney Street in Portland. I have a son that Mr. Razio, attends... can you talk into the mic so that... Sure. I, uh, I have a son that attends during high school. I just wanted to make a comment about last week's meeting about the attendance at sporting events for the high school kids. Um, it was a comment made by, um, I believe, the AD of Portland High School about an altercation that happened at Daring High School after a football game that I wanted clarification if my local school board representative in District 5 could answer me maybe privately later, that the boys involved in this altercation actually received a um, consequence of just not being able to attend Daring High School events, away events, was their um, consequence for an assault on a student from Casco Bay, which is essentially what all students got as a consequence um, of this letter where they cannot attend events of the other schools. Um, and I think that's where we sort of, um, we've allowed these things to escalate by not properly identifying these kids who are creating these behaviors at these sporting events 
and basically disciplining them accordingly. Um, honestly, if these kids were only just told that they can't attend during high school events, I'm not shocked that these incident incidents then escalated the following weekend at a Portland um, event. So I'm, I'm just curious about what actually happened as a consequence of the first event to the students involved and how we got to where we are today. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. Good evening. Um, my name is Heather Sawyer, and I have two children that attend the Portland Public Schools, and they've attended since they were in kindergarten. They're currently in 11th and 8th grade. For the past six years, I've been a science teacher during high school. I also serve as an advisor for student government, and all of those six years, I've also been a class advisor. So, I am pretty close with the students. I talk to them on a regular basis. I know every single student that is sitting here today. I love my job. I love my students. And I love Daring High School. I am here tonight for two reasons. The first is that on October 5th, I shared with you via email a petition and an email to express our concern and our disagreement over this decision that has been made about attendance of sporting events and dances. To not allow our students to attend each other's dances and sporting events. It's my belief and the belief of all 700 parents and students that signed this petition that this is a blanket policy that punishes all students for the actions of a few. I'm here tonight to continue to share my disagreement with this decision. Since I did not respond, didn't receive any acknowledgement or response to this email, I'm here again to say it publicly. This policy pub punished my student. He was playing football. He was on the football field when this happened. And as a result of this policy, he couldn't take his girlfriend to homecoming. He can't go see her volleyball games. And all of these students that attend their classes, that behave themselves, that represent during high school are being punished as a result of this. In my petition, I've offered up solutions. I'm not here to just complain and to blame. I've offered up solutions. Let's have more chaperones. Let's have parents volunteer. We have a strong boosters club. We will help chaperone. Let's have teachers. Let's have more admin. Let's send out consistent messaging to all of our schools, to all of our students about what the behavior expectations are, and let's reinforce that. Let's not continue to pu punish all of our students for this. The second reason that I'm here today is I want to support our student leaders. It's my understanding that all of the student leaders from each of the three high schools are going to be preparing a statement for you. And what that statement is going to consist of is what the role of the students will be in changing behaviors and changing this and helping out with this. I'm concerned about this because I don't want our student leaders that are already our best, our brightest, putting themselves out there, being the face of Portland Public Schools, they shouldn't have to bear the burden of this problem. This is an adult problem. The adults need to fix it. The admin, the teachers, the school board, if needed, need to fix this problem, need to address this problem, not put it on a, our school student leaders. Ms. Sawyer, do you need any more time? I'm good. Thank you okay. very much. I just want to mention sure. that um, I personally did not receive your email and I just searched my... No, I sent it to Mr. Botana and Mr. Townsend. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Are there other members of the public that would like to address the board? Hi, my name is Santino Cavallaro. I'm a sophomore at Deering High School. Hi, I'm Miles Hibbert. I'm a junior at Deering High School. <laughs> and we're here to talk about um, us not being able to go to like other dances and games um, for Portland. Um, I feel that we should be able to because um, if it's come to the actions of a few, uh, we're not able to, and um, we have, I mean, we're, we have friends that go to Portland. Um, I have like a bunch of friends that go there and I'm not able to go watch them play when we have a game on a Saturday and they have a game on a Friday. Um, I know a bunch of kids that, you know, had girlfriends and boyfriends that they couldn't bring to dances. And, you know, I know that was tough on them because they really wanted to go with each other and, you know, it's tough and you can't do that. Um, and 
it's just, you know, when I want to go watch my friends and cheer them on at Portland games, I can't do that. When they want to come to our games and cheer us on, they can't do that. And, you know, it just kind of divides the community we have between the two high schools because, you know, there's a rivalry and everything that stays on the field, but out, off the field, we are still friends and we still want to support each other and see each other succeed. And, you know, it's hard to do that with this new rule. Well said. Well said. I think that's that's all I need to say. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you both for being here. I agree. Very well said. Are there other members of the public that would like to address the board? I'm going to just check on Zoom. I didn't see any hands up. No. So if there's other folks that are here. Good evening. Name is John Rousseau, 1455 Riverton Road. And I just want to say, I'm behind these students and teachers and adults. Um, why are you disciplining the entire class or the high school? Why are you disciplining over a couple of bad apples, a couple of bad actors? You know, uh, I think those people need to be addressed. And again, I think there's some very good ideas here. So I think perhaps you should open up the discussion again and have a decision because I think right now, um, even though you're in your letter from the 14th of October, uh, it was sudden, um, but you didn't allow time for dialogue and interacting with students. So, Mr. Superintendent, please retract this policy tonight. Thank you. Thank you, John. Are there other members of the public that would like to address the board? Hi, board. Hi, friends. Uh, sorry I'm late. I'm here on behalf of my Victoria, interest, Victoria Furman. Victoria. I live at 169 Longfellow Street. Sorry, out of practice. Um, I'm here representing, one, all of the sports teams, but also my two high school sons who couldn't come because they are currently practicing on other sports teams that they play with both high school team members, so Portland High and Deering High students. One's at a basketball game. One is at a lacrosse game. What we're doing to our students right now by separating them on the behalf of some students and due to the actions of some students is affecting them in the other areas of their lives and does not support the Portland Promise or our behavioral policy. Sorry, ran up the stairs, guys. <laughs> As I stated in my email, and you will see in their emails to come, there is a group of students that are emailing and rallying behind each other and the words of these boys that have spoken, that they want this retracted. They have games coming up. It's not just playoffs, and it's creating a deeper division. I understand, and they understand, the action of some and how grave it was. But this is not how Portland shows the rest of the state and our country that we believe in equality for all and showing how to come back together. So please, let's find a better way for our students, especially after years where they have been separated and they finally could be together again. Thank you, Victoria. Are there any other members of the public that would like to adjust the board? Julianne Opperman, Woodmont Street. I wasn't going to speak tonight. I, I normally say something, but I wasn't going to. But I have to say that I am extremely proud of these young men and women because they speak up for what they need and they are not asking for anything that's unreasonable. I do think that there was just a slight mention of what the problem is and it's not the problem of everybody um, and it's sort of it's an inequitable situation when everybody is punished and the person who were involved in it were not and I, I I'm knocking on doors. I ran into some people who were involved in the situations. So I would say, I think the discipline situation in the schools needs to be addressed very carefully. I'm not saying you throw them all out, but be careful with that. And I'm looking forward to see what you want to say about 
people in schools because that's what this is all about. Thank you, Julianne. I'll just note, it, note that the first um, two members of the public who spoke to the board were, in fact, girls. Excuse me, ladies. Are there other... Are there other members of the public that would like to address the board? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and close public comment. Um, to everyone who is here tonight, especially to the students, thank you so much for being here, for sharing your experience. It's really good for the board to hear. And I know you're busy and you had to take your time and figure out how to get here and all of that and just really appreciate it. And we will definitely take your feedback into account. Okay, now we are going to the report of the chair. And I just have a short report tonight. I want to encourage everyone to vote. We'll have one additional meeting before election day on November 8th. But as folks probably know, um, it is possible to vote right now. So um, elections have a big impact on public education from the resources available to efforts to prescribe what we what and how we teach. And this year, the Charter Commission has proposed question five to um, address the school budget process. We're holding a parent university on question five next Wednesday, October 26th at 6.30 p.m. Um, please um, try to be there. You will have the opportunity to hear from both sides of the issue and to have your questions answered. Again, it's next Wednesday, October 26th at 6.30 p.m. And that's on, uh, on Zoom. Um, as I mentioned, you can vote early now in person at City Hall. City Hall is open for walk-in voters Monday through Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., and then uh, an hour later, so until 5.30 on Wednesdays. Um, you also can request an absentee ballot online if you want to do your uh, fill out your ballot at home by um, going online or by calling the city clerk's office during business hours. And then, of course, you can vote in person on Election Day, November 8th, when polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And that is it for my report tonight. So I'm going to turn right to the report of the students. And tonight we're hearing from Abdul Alzamili of Portland High School. Abdul, take it away. <clears throat> uh, this week is our spirit week. Um, yesterday was Adam Sandler versus the Minions <laughs> theme. And today was anything but a backpack. Uh, anything but a backpack day as well as pajama day and i've truly seen some uh, creative people today uh somebody came in with a rain barrel um <laughs> there was a kayak <laughs> a shopping cart so yeah we, we had a lot of fun with that <laughs> um tomorrow is culture day which i'm very excited about um so we kicked off the Spirit Week with Homecoming, which saw about 530 PHS students. I attended, and I think everybody thought that it was a great time. Uh, last week, we had the PSATs for the juniors. Uh, FAFSA night for the seniors is this Thursday. NW, NW, ugh, sophomores are taking NWEAs next week, so October has been a very busy month. Thankfully, due to our great guidance counselors all seniors are working to meet their college deadlines in what is a pretty stressful time in our lives this friday uh, phs's football team faces sopos for the battle of the bridge i wish good luck to everybody involved uh, para con parent conferences are at the end of this month uh, the quarter ends in a couple of weeks so classes are definitely ramping up now uh, there's a senior UMaine college visit, November 2nd, targeted to help BIPOC students see a college campus. Juniors have a bus trip on November 10th to go see colleges including St. Joseph's, SMCC, CMCC, Bates, and Thomas. And that's all. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Abdul. I wish that I could have seen some of those costumes today. Sounds pretty fun. All right. And so with that, we are moving to the report of the superintendent, Superintendent Patano. 
Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Abdullah, for that report. Um, I would like to extend condolences on behalf of the Portland Public Schools to the family and friends of Otis Thompson, a Peaks Island resident, former educator, PPS principal, and former board member who passed away recently. Mr. Thompson had a long and illustrious career, much of it here in PPS. Among other things, he was instrumental in the conception of Casco Bay High School. Uh, may he rest in peace. Staffing continues to be our greatest challenge this year. On Friday, we had to activate our EdTech reassignment um, strategy. One EdTech from East End and one from Casco Bay were redeployed to the FLS program, um, which we call Bridge at Talbot, um, starting yesterday. Uh, for the end of last week, members of the academic team supplemented existing staff while we pulled together the reassignments. This comes in spite of the efforts that I outlined at the last board meeting, including our aggressive hiring sweep, increased rates for substitutes, and a bonus for staff who help us to fill a teacher or ed tech vacancy. Following on our board meeting presentation about the decision to limit student attendance at sporting events, school leaders have been engaging students and parents this week and um, looking ahead to determine how to ensure a fun and safe athletic experience for everyone for the playoffs and the winter season. We expect to have direct communication for middle school and high school parents and students later this week. Our second reimagining family engagement session is scheduled for tomorrow from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at East End Community School. Excuse me, my computer is doing something funny right now. This is part of our effort to transform and expand our understanding of family engagement to reflect our diverse community. Last week, we had our second middle school shared space cafe for families. This one was at Moore. The final session in the middle school series is scheduled for November 1st at Lincoln Middle School. We are in the process of organizing a shared space cafe at Rowe Elementary School, where an influx of new students has raised concerns and requires community building efforts such as these. I'm grateful to our Executive Director for Communications and Community Engagement, Dr. Grace Valenzuela, and our, our partners at Portland Empowered for their efforts to advance this important work, which reflects our priority of elevating diverse voices in our work. I also would like to remind you that the Board Public Engagement Committee will be on site at the Farmer's Market at Deering Oaks next Saturday, or this coming Saturday, from 7, to 1, 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. We are also finalizing sorry. We are also finalizing details for a parent university session on the Charter Commission question five, as you heard earlier, which will be next Wednesday, October 26 at 6:30 p.m. and that will be entirely remote. Finally, a reminder that we are partnering with the Finance Authority of Maine, FAME, to host two FAFSA nights for students and their families. Tonight, DHS um, is Faf DHS FAFSA night is going on um, starting in uh, six minutes um, um, and until 8.30 p.m. Um, and as you heard um, from Mr. Alzamili, the PHS uh, FAME FAFSA night is this Thursday, also from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. As I mentioned last week, um, Casco Bay students and in fact any main high school student can attend either of those two sessions, the one tonight or the one on Thursday. And that concludes my report. Thank you so much, Mr. Superintendent. Okay. okay. Yes, Ms. Bondo, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent, for the presentation. Just a few, just a few clarification and details, if you have on the uh, the the one the school leaders will engage the families and parents. Do we know what kind of format? Is going to be like a focus group, or is going so? Uh, um, how Mr. Is going to Townsend, is would you be able to?
Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, you know, I think it's varied a little bit by school. I know, um, you know, following this last week, there was a, you know, during PTO meetings. So there was certainly dialogue and discussion there. I know that there's been outreach to some of the booster communities at both of the schools who have had concerns and reached, uh, reached out to the athletic directors. Um, and I know that they've had some student leadership engagements at both of the schools. Just a sub question, sir. So as the parents have that communication clear, so we have enough parents attending those those kind of uh, conversation. So are we are we communicate with parents just to make sure that we're spreading the the word about what's going to happen so the parents can attend and have that, that clear communication and engagement so we can find a solution. Um you know I mean they have done some of the outreach, you know, I think always we welcome additional communication. I think in, you know, with this issue, as we've been managing it, trying to balance both time for substantive engagement and recognizing the concerns brought forward by students, as we heard tonight, about making timely decisions about how we move forward with the fall. So we're wanting to, you know, and we've gotten consistent feedback that we think has been helpful and look forward to communicating with the full community this week, as the superintendent said. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fondo. Mr. Grant. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I wanted to say a few words about Otis Thompson. I was very happy to see the superintendent mention him. I wasn't sure that was going to happen, so I, I came prepared to say just a few words. Uh, I'm a close friend of the Thompson family, and I have been since um, Otis's son, Adam, and I cut our teeth in state politics in the early years of the Baldacci administration. Uh, and we also came to find out that Otis and his family grew up with my father on the, the mean streets of Millinocket in the, in the 50s. Um, I was able to attend the funeral on Peaks Island over the weekend, and I came to appreciate it even more what an honorable, decent, visionary man Otis was. And it's a he's a great loss to the uh, family and the community. And I want to officially send uh, my condolences to all of the Thompsons and, and hold them close to our hearts. So thank you for a few minutes to let me say that. Thank you so much, Mr. Grant. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, I now have a request of the board, which is to move um, our business agenda items up. Um, we have uh, several people here with us tonight um, representing the EdTech Union, as well as our um, additional appointee to the superintendent search committee. And so, um, unless there's a, an objection, if we can move those two business items up, and then after those business items, we would go... Um, and do the board focus, um, I would appreciate it. So um, everyone doesn't have to wait around. Is there any objection? Just going to look um, to see our board members who are online. I don't see any objections. So we will go forward um, with that new business. Thank you, everyone. So consideration and action to ratify a collective bargaining contract with the educational tech technicians Unit for FY22 to FY24. Is there a motion? Mr. Grant, seconded by Ms. Bondo. Mr. Superintendent, will you please speak to this motion? Um, I'm going to ask um, our Executive Director for Human Resources, uh, Barb Stoddard, to speak to this. <clears throat> I don't think I'm out of you're you're jumping right in. I'm jump Oh, I did you. Well, but Barbara just set uh, me up here, so uh, I, I uh, always follow direction. Uh, you know, she's in charge. So, uh, that's um, so instead, our lead negotiator, Campbell Badger, is going to uh, present this item. So, Campbell. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to jump in. And, nope, that's totally fine. You guys you. know so, what you're so, doing. I'm just the whatever. Yeah. So. Uh, Good evening, everyone. I just want correction. It's uh, it's a contract from uh, September first, two thousand and one, two thousand twenty one to two thousand twenty four, not two thousand twenty two. So, just um, that's. Uh, uh, I said fiscal year, but yeah, I I understand. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean and and. and didn't mean to seem like an inappropriately correct to do. That was not my intent there. Um, uh, I just wanted to make rest assured that the contract was going to be retroactive to September 1st of 2021. So you have before you, uh, I sent out a um, in advance a uh, uh, just a summary of the tentative agreement. So I just want to briefly go over those. Um, 
So this was this is a contract, a three year contract. Uh, it started late um, because of uh, COVID and things like that. So we didn't get started straight away, um, and uh, that's why the 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 contract is is going to be retroactive and goes all the way back to the start of last year. Just uh, on salaries, uh, the 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 salary increase over the term of the contract is a three percent for the first year, followed by a two percent and another two percent. Those are scale adjustments, and so then um, if you include within the salary scale, people get step increases. So a step increase is two point five percent. So the aggregate increase of this co collective bargaining contract is five point five in the first year, four point five in the second year, and. Uh, 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 4.4, I think, in the in the third year of the contract, there was also some uh, some modifications to the language. I think the most significant is the length of the uh, of the work year. Uh, the parties agreed to add two additional workshop days, um, so that's going to provide additional uh, time for training and uh, uh, and and work on lesson plans and things like that in collaboration with the teachers so that's going to be a big benefit uh for the terms of the collective bargaining contract there's also some other provisions um which is some modifications to the grievance procedure uh which would allow the the union also to file uh grievances on behalf of its membership um as opposed to currently or in the in the uh, expired contract only an uh, an employee was allowed to do that we also have a provision within for professional development that allows specialized uh, professional development for individual groups of, of teachers and I'm sorry, of educational technicians, including on early release days. So that's going to allow a, a additional flexibility for for the administration and obviously is going to benefit the hardworking uh, educational technicians. And then we have some adjustments for uh, when when an educational technician uh, um, substitutes for uh, the classroom teacher, there's an increase in the differential uh, to reflect the the additional um, responsibilities that are required. And also, um, there's a recognition, obviously, of uh, of the uh, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day uh, in the collective bargaining contract, and also a recognition of the Juneteenth. And, and Juneteenth doesn't normally. Uh, uh, occur during the work year for educational technicians, uh, but for for those that do uh, work through uh, during that period of time, then that's a recognized paid uh, holiday. I I just want to thank uh, the, the the negotiating team for the board, which was um, uh, uh, Yusef Yusef, uh, the special ed director or special service director Jesse Applegate, uh, principal Beverly Stevens, and and of course. Barbara Starnard for for all their hard work and help. I also want to thank the um, the uh, the association and the hard work that they put in. Uh, that and uh, the new president uh, Jen Cooper, uh, the former president Michelle Lawless, um, Shanna Blotcher, I believe, and then uh, and also the help of Carrie uh, Dowdy and and uh, Beth Arsenal who who helped us reach. It was a difficult set of negotiations, but I really appreciated the hard work that everyone put in and the flexibility. And ultimately, I believe it's a good contract for um, the Portland in it. And, and it reflects the hard work that that your educational uh, technicians put in for the, for the district and your students. So um, I, I, you know, I, it's a it's a strong contract. So thank you, Campbell. Are there questions for Campbell? or for the superintendent or Ms. Stoddard. And let me look at our board members who are joining us remotely. I don't see any hands up. Um, all right. Um, yes, Mr. Grant. I'm sorry if I missed this, but has the union voted on this yet or does that happen after we, we go? If, they, if, they have. They okay. have. I'm sorry if I missed that at the beginning. No, I'm sorry. I should have said that in the beginning. I apologize. Yes, they voted and they ratified the contract. Yes. Um, if it's all right with the board, I'd love to see if Ms. Cooper would like to make a, um, a statement to us. Thank you, Campbell. Thank you. Good evening, Jen Cooper, uh, EdTech Union President. Um, I'd just like to thank the many people involved in helping to get our contract to this point. Uh, thank you to P President. Carrie Downey back there and um, Chief Negotiator Beth Arsenault for joining our team in the finalization of our contract. I'd also like to sh thank Shana Blotner, our current uh, EdTech Vice President, 
and Michelle Lawless, our outgoing union president, for the many hours and months of hard work that they have uh, dedicated to this contract. Our team has been led for the last six years by Michelle um, as our chief negotiator. She's now stepped into the role as a teacher, so this team is forever grateful for the many hours of dedication that Michelle has given to our unit. Her endless work for advocating for her colleagues and the guidance she has provided us has been overwhelming. So I just wanted to recognize that tonight. Um, we're pleased to have settled this contract. Um, we look forward to continuing the work to make a livable wage for the many staff who support the students every day. So thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Jen. Okay, with that, I'm going to go to board comment. So uh, board discussion, any members of the board like to speak to this motion to the ed tech contract? I have a comment. Go ahead, Ms. Bondo and then Mr. Grant. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I just want to, to send my gratitude and appreciation for the patience and everything the it take they went through just to wait for the for the final decision here to happen and we just just the way to value the support that you've been giving to the learning strategy to all our students so good appreciation and um, I'm I'm in favor of voting yes thank you Ms. Bondo Mr. Grant oh, yeah, thank you just similarly I wanted to echo uh, my congratulations to all those involved. I've been in, on both sides of union negotiations and I know how draining they can be. So I'm very appreciative to those of you who uh, stuck it out and, and what came up with what seems like a very positive result. So um, kudos all around. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Anyone else? All right. I will just say um, thank you to everyone who participated um, in this negotiation, to Mr. Youssef for representing the board, um, to the um, to the full team on both sides. I know this took a, a, a year of work and was not easy at times. And I want to just really deeply appreciate um, everyone coming together at the end. Um, I think this is a good contract. Um, and I, I also want to just echo Jen's um, uh, goal of uh, ensuring that our staff are being paid a, li a livable wage. Um, I know the work of uh, that um, all of the ed techs do is just central to um, our work as a school district. Um, you you do you you are you're the glue. So I'm just deeply appreciative for all that you do um, and for the hard work that went into this contract. I wish that it hadn't taken so much time, but I am um, so grateful that we, we've we gotten to this outcome. So thank you um, to everyone. Thank you so much to Ms. Cooper um, and uh, to the full team. So with that, by roll call vote, please indicate whether you support a ratifying a collective bargaining contract with the Educational Technicians Unit for September 1st, 2021 to August 31st, 2024. Mr. Superintendent, will you please call the roll? Yes, Chair. Uh, Ms. Bondo? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Burke? Yes. Ms. Russell Better? Yes. Ms. Bryden? Yes. Ms. Lentz? Yes. Mr. Grant? Yes. Mr. Alzamili? Oh. Right here. Okay. Um, Ms. Dew? Yes. And uh, Chair Figdor? Yes. So the contract is unanimously ratified with our student voting with the majority. Congratulations. Now we're on to consideration and action to approve the appointments committee community representative for Portland Adult Education to the superintendent search committee. Is there a motion? Ms. Bryden, seconded by Ms. Russell Batter. Mr. Superintendent, would you like to speak to this motion? Yes. At last week's meeting, you approved a slate of seven community representatives to serve on the superintendent search committee. And at that meeting, you also approved an amendment to the original resolution to add an eighth community member to, to the search committee who would represent Portland adult education. 
Subsequent to that approval, the appointments committee met virtually to review the PAE applicants on the list. Um, they also consulted with uh, Portland Adult Education Director Abby Yamamoto to understand the pros and cons of different applicants. The appointments committee decided to recommend Lucy Shulman, a Portland resident who is currently an hourly adjunct faculty instructor at Portland Adult Ed. Lucy is also a former PAE student and has also worked as a mentor for Portland Adult Education okay. Summer Program. She's taught English overseas and is currently working on her master's degree in teaching at USM. Um, Lucy is here with us tonight. Um, thank you for your willingness to serve on the search committee um, representing our largest Portland Public Schools, um, Portland Adult Ed. Um, so thank you so much, Mr. Superintendent. Are there questions on the motion? Just checking Zoom, I see none. I'm gonna to move to public comment. Is there any public comment on the motion? Seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment and move to board discussion. And I just, for the board, after we vote, I'm going to see if Lucy will come up and introduce herself to us. So is there any board discussion? All right. Um, I'll just say I want to thank Lucy for being willing to serve. It's, I think, very important to have a representative for, from PAE on our superintendent search committee, um, and we look forward to working with you. So with that, um, by roll call vote, please indicate whether you support consideration and action or whether you support action to approve the appointments committee community representative for Portland Adult Education to the superintendent search committee. Mr. Superintendent, will you please call the roll? Yes, Chair Ms. Bondo. Yes. Mr. Burke. Yes. Ms. Russell Better. Yes. Ms. Bryden. Yes. Ms. Lentz. Yes. Mr. Grant. Yes. Ms. Dew. Yes. And Chair Figdor. Yes. So the appointment is unanimously approved with our student voting with the majority. And Lucy, if you'd come up um, to the podium and introduce yourself, um, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, uh, I'm Lucy Shulman. I'm a resident of Portland, as you mentioned earlier. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to um, serve my community as um, on the superintendent search committee. PAE has been really good to me, both as a student and as a teacher. And um, I'm feel confident in my ability to represent their interests in the superintendent search committee and um, for the rest of the Portland public school district. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you so much, Lucy. We look forward to it. And thank you for making the time to be here tonight. Really appreciate that. Okay, so now we are on to our board focus on educational issues, which is the, an update on our people goal. Mr. Superintendent, will you introduce tonight's board focus? Um, gladly, and um, I believe, Aaron, you're running the presentation. Yep. So tonight's uh, board focus is a deep dive into our people goal. The people goal was conceived as a way to acknowledge and elevate the fact that we are a people organization. Um, you often hear, um, especially during our budget process and sometimes in a fairly derisive way, that over 80% of our budget is for people. People Goal recognizes that we cannot meet our other goals unless we have, as the goal itself specifies, the most talented and diverse group of people working together to achieve those goals. Um, this was visually depicted. Can you go to the next slide? Um, actually, one more. This was um, depicted originally in our rendition of the Portland Promise by being the base on which the other goals rested or stood. This recognition never changed. We've understood that this is an enduring reality for us. Um, as the visualization of the Portland Promise evolved, people was depicted as interacting with the other goals. So in keeping with that idea that it is, you know, um, necessary for us to be able to meet the 
central goal um, that is equity. And finally, as you can see in the final rendition, we understood and reflected the inextricable link between people and equity. And a good part of today's discussion is going to focus on that link. As the Educators of Color report told us, we cannot achieve equitable results for students without focusing time, energy, and resources to create truly equitable working conditions for our staff of color. The People Goal specifically recognizes that a diverse workforce is key to achieving our goals, and the Educators of Color report told us that our efforts to recruit a diverse workforce was um, running straight up against a work culture that was less than receptive, inclusive, and supportive for those diverse staff. Tonight's presentation will update you on the work that we've done to increase belonging for all of our staff with a focus on the work that we're doing to make our institution welcoming and supportive of our diverse workforce, especially our educators of color. As you know, our Executive Director for Human Resources, Barb Stoddard, is departing next month. Um, I will say more about that later. Um, but in anticipation of her departure, we started this summer to redesign the organizational structure that would support our efforts to achieve our goals to create an inclusive working environment with increasing collective efficacy among all of our staff. To that end, as depicted here, we are redistributing human resources functions to better position us to do that. Specifically, functions that are transactional HR functions, things such as benefits, credentialing, and the hiring processes will move over to the district ops division under executive director for district operations, Terry Young. HR operations will be led by Chris St. Louis, who was recently promoted into that position. The strategic work of human resources, the work to recruit, support, and create an increasingly inclusive and supportive workplace, shift to a new division under Barrett Wilkinson's um, leadership, who I've asked to serve as our executive director of diversity, equity, and belonging. Functions located under Barrett's leadership include our BIPOC career pathways, our mentoring supports, staff evaluation, and labor relations. Barrett retains, of course, leadership for our equity work district-wide and, and also oversees our student equity and advocacy work. With that, I would like to turn this over to Barb, who will discuss our overall progress against the goal, and then you'll hear from both Barrett on our overall belonging work, and then from our BIPOC Pathways Director, Julia Hazel. So, uh, so Barb. Great. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Next slide, Aaron. So, uh, this is my final board meeting in my current role. Um, as I prepare my for my own next steps, I want to just take a moment to thank the board and the superintendent for giving me the opportunity to serve Portland Public Schools over the last nine and a half years. It's been an amazing experience and truly has been the highlight of my career. I was fortunate to be with the district and in my current role when Superintendent Botana joined us. I was able to witness, experience, and engage in the birth of the Portland Promise, along with the launch of our work to diversify our workforce. When I reflect back to when I started with the district in 2013 and consider where we are today as a district, I am both proud and amazed by the progress that we've made. Javier, you are an exemplar for what it looks like to be committed to a vision and to a set of values. I continue to be inspired by your dedication and um, to elevating student voice and centering marginalized groups. Your leadership has allowed this work to flourish. When we launched the Portland Promise in 2016, we named five strategies, articulating our core values, strengthening our people data systems, building a comprehensive PD strategy, building career pathways that motivate and retain our people, and developing a diversity recruitment strategy. Over the last six years, we have worked on all of these strategies. Despite interruptions in our work due to the global pandemic, we achieved our five-year goal of reaching 10% staff of color within four years. Some of the significant pieces of the work that I'd like to mention have laid a foundation for our diversity work that we continue to develop and build on. You'll be hearing more about this work in specific detail from Barrett and Julia shortly. In the summer of 2017, we started our diversity work with the launch of Teach Portland. 
the initial year, that initial year, we had 40 participants who joined us to learn more about becoming educators. They worked as interns in our summer classrooms. With the exception of the summer of 2020, Teach Portland continues to operate and also expanded to a program during the school year at Portland Adult Education called the Education Academy. These programs were really our start of the intentional focus on diversifying our staff with a Grow Your Own program. We also began looking more closely at our internal processes for hiring. In 2019, we rolled out an equity hiring toolkit to all hiring managers. We continue to update this document and to think more deeply about how to increase all staff engagement with the toolkit itself. Over the last six years, there have been many layers of DEI-focused professional development for our staff, including work that Barrett launched and led as part of the Equity Leaders Cohort, implicit bias awareness and bias in hiring training, and significant and intentional district-wide training that was completed in the spring of 2021 following the publication of the Educators of Color report. I'm just naming a few of the many pieces of work and the contributions of many, many staff members that have brought us to where we are today. Next slide. When we launched the Promise back in 2016, we identified two baseline metrics to measure our progress. We identified our annual TNTP survey as the tool that we would use to gather information and feedback from our employees related to employee satisfaction. We chose to use the Net Promoter Score as a proxy for employee engagement. I'll share a bit more about the Net Promoter in just a minute. The second measure that we began tracking was the increase in the number of staff who identify as people of color. Next slide. For newer board members who are not familiar with what a Net Promoter Score is, this slide is really a brief tutorial. The Net Promoter is a business metric that measures customer loyalty and satisfaction based on a single question that asks respondents whether they would recommend a product or service to a friend, colleague, or family member. We chose to use the Net Promoter Score as a proxy for staff engagement by asking all staff the following question. How likely are you to recommend working at Portland Public Schools to a friend? Staff choose a response by selecting a number between zero and 10, with zero being low and 10 being high. The net promoter score is calculated by taking the percentage of staff who are promoters, and promoters are those who are loyal, enthusiastic fans. They're the green smiley faces at the right-hand end um, over the scores of nine and 10, and you subtract the percent of staff who are detractors. Detractors are those who are dissatisfied or unhappy as shown by the sad red faces that are associated with the scores of zero to six. People who rate the question as a seven or an eight are called passives. Passives are generally supportive, but less enthusiastic, and they are excluded from the calculation of the net promoter score. So the net promoter score itself is on a scale from negative 100 to positive 100, where a score of negative 100 would mean that everyone who responded was in the detractors group. And a score of positive 100 would mean that everyone who responded was a promoter. A net promoter score that is greater than zero is considered good, meaning you have more promoters than detractors. And a net promoter score of 50 is considered excellent. Next slide, please. So this is a look at our history of net promoter scores. This, we started collecting this data in the spring of 2018. We saw a pretty significant increase in our promoters and a decrease in our detractors in the 2019-20 survey year. That survey was completed shortly after we shut down at the start of the pandemic during the period when staff were fully remote. There was virtually no change the following year when we were hybrid. In the survey this past spring, we experienced an increase in our detractors. This was not an unexpected result. Following the shutdown of our, and our hybrid year, the return to full-time in-person work was extremely challenging for many of our staff. Additionally, all industries and education in particular experienced pandemic fatigue that resulted in the great resignation. We also ask a follow-up question as part of this where people, we ask people why they selected the score. And we look at this to see if we can identify any specific patterns in those responses. As we are deepening our focus on equity and increasing our focus on belonging as central to our work, 
we're also rethinking whether the Net Promoter Score is the right measure for employee engagement and satisfaction, or whether another measure or an additional measure might provide a stronger gauge for staff engagement. Next slide. While our Net Promoter Score is below zero for this year, there is still a great deal to celebrate. Briefly recapping some of the great diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work that has been ongoing in the district thus far. We have created staff awareness and implemented action steps toward mitigating bias in our hiring processes through the Equity Hiring Toolkit and staff professional development. Our staff diversity efforts have made significant gains, not only exceeding our five-year goal of 10%, they have now reached 14% of BIPOC staff as of this fall. The board's financial support in FY22 of our new BIPOC leadership and career pathways role has substantially accelerated the progress made in the last 12 months through st strategic programs and offerings, as you'll hear more about from Julia Hazel shortly. The research and resulting educators of color report that was led by Bowdoin Professor Dora Santoro and also included Julia Hazel and Alberto Morales as part of the research team was pivotal to our staff culture and belonging work. It has become a foundational document for us in the district. The Employees of Color report highlighted the deep disconnect between our people goal and our equity goal, that our BIPOC staff believed that our equity efforts were intended for students alone. As we reflected on the report, we knew we needed to create strong, inclusive cultures that focused on a sense of community and belonging. As a side note here, when I started in this role in 2015, the HR department functioned in a more traditional way and was mostly focused on transactional work. When the promise was launched and it included a people goal, a body of strategic work was created that has continued to grow. The new HR structure acknowledges this important body of work and supports the continued growth of our people strategy efforts. This is the essence of the new diversity, equity, and belonging department. Julia Hazel brings skills and lived experience to her role in the district, this new role, and this paired with Barrett's equity expertise is generating a focused and thoughtful approach to creating a sense of belonging for all staff in the district. Finally, with the support of the Foundation for Portland Public Schools, we have attracted multiple grants to lift and deepen the people goal work, including a partnership with the Barr Foundation and TNTP that is focused on talent acquisition and data management, and the New Schools Venture Fund that is supporting our educator career pathways. Next slide. These next few slides provide an update of the staff diversity. This is a historical snapshot of our efforts to diversify our workforce. As shown here, we've moved our overall numbers from just under 7% staff of color in 2016 to 14% this fall, essentially doubling the number of BIPOC staff in the district. Next slide, please. In this slide, I've pulled out detailed data for three of our staff units. Our administrators, those covered by the PAA contract, our educators are those covered by the PEA contract, and our ed techs. Most notable is the change we've had in our administrators group this year, with BIPOC staff making up 19% of our administrators. Our educator group has more than tripled the number of BIPOC educators since 2016. The percentage of educators of color is moving more slowly for this group due to the overall size of the group, yet we continue to make steady progress. While still very strong, we saw a slight decline in the percentage of our BIPOC ed techs this year. As you'll hear from Julia, we have deepened and grown the career pathways work with both educators who want to become administrators and with ed techs who want to become teachers. These people are already part of Portland Public Schools. They know us, they love our students, and they embrace our mission. Creating these opportunities for learning and career growth is a key retention tool and one that we have elevated in this past year. Next slide, please. This is a snapshot of the breakdown of our staff demographics as of September, 2022. It shows a breakdown by employee group of white and BIPOC staff. What this slide doesn't reflect is the relative size of each group to each other. The numbers on the right show the total size, it's pretty hard to read, but it shows the total size of each group. And as I just mentioned, while the percentage of our educators unit remains the least diverse with only 9% BIPOC educators, the number of BIPOC 
educators has more than tripled from 23 in 2016 to 74 this year. We continue to see high rates of BIPOC staff in our non-represented bargaining uh, group, and this includes district office employees and our multilingual staff. We are making progress. However, PPS remains 86% white. Our staff diversity data continues to substantially lag our student demographics. For this year, our data shows that our students of color comprise 49% of the student population. This data continues to call us to the work that lies ahead. Before I pass the deck over to Barrett and then to Julia, I want to add that this has really been an incredible privilege to work with our leadership team in the district. As a community, we are so, so lucky to have people, this, exception, this exceptional group of people. They're smart, they're dedicated, they're passionate, and they always seem to find uh, humor, even in the most challenging times. I also want to express my appreciation to all Portland Public School staff. I have built amazing relationships and friendships with so many people over the years. I will always hold them close to my heart. While I might be stepping away from this role, I will never be far away from Portland schools. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Barrett. I will um, save my feelings on Barb uh, departing us, but um, say that I'm very grateful to be with you tonight and to serve in this uh, additional capacity for Portland Public Schools. Um, for those of you I haven't met directly, my name is Barrett Wilkinson. I'm the Executive Director of Diversity, Equity, and Belonging for Portland Public Schools in advance, Aaron. So, um, Barbara's already mentioned TNTP, which is the new teacher project, which does all kinds of important research in the field of education. Um, and this slide comes from um, their work about, um, you know, the, the talent landscape. And we might just call this our people work. Um, but you'll see in this circle, all of these are essential components of what it takes to create, um, you know, a comprehensive quality um a uh, selection of diverse teachers that supports successful student experience. The the yellow, orange, sorry, yellow, green uh, triangles there are the key areas that we'll talk a little bit more about um, because there's key work happening related to that in Portland. So we've been working on many aspects of this, as Barb talked about since um, before I joined the district, which was in uh, 2017. It's been um, almost exactly uh, around this time of year I joined the district in 2017. Um, and the work has expanded and shifted um, over that time as we've continued to learn more. Um, for purposes of, of further reflection, um, when we, when my first role, uh, when I came to join the district, we were the only district in the state that had anyone explicitly focused on equity in this kind of way. Um, since then, I now have colleagues across the state in Bangor and Lewiston and South Portland and Westbrook, in addition to more people focused on this work in Portland. Um, and alongside that, the field of HR continues to go deeper. So a lot of large organizations have had you know, an office of diversity, equity, belonging, and large school districts have had that too, but now we're starting to see it uh, more and more. And we're seeing the addition of belonging. So it's diversity, equity, belonging, or diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, um, which I think is really important because we're going to talk a lot about belonging um, as it relates, it relates to this. Um, so a lot of our initial work focused on staff professional learning related to equity literacy. And while those efforts are important and ongoing, as Barb talked about, we really see a fuller picture now because of the people work and this evolution. People bring their full selves to this work and the ways in which we embrace and support those, you know, lived experiences and identities factors into their experiences here and helps us uh, and helps us determine if, if um, you know, this is a place they want to be and stay long term, which is what, you know, we want. We'll go forward. So we've talked a bit about um, the equity hiring toolkit, but one of those um, green arrows was about employee selection. So the equity hiring toolkit is, you know, is both about, um, you know, improving the practices that we use to bring new people uh, in through our hiring practices, as well as to address bias that occurs in hiring. And that is not a problem that's unique to Portland, mm -hmm. certainly, but um you know, there's lots of research on this, um, and I 
feel very passionately about the work we can continue to do through, through the equity hiring toolkit. Um, one of, as an example, one of the things we're doing to further advance that is to create more of like a I mean, it's a, it's already a toolkit. It's not huge, but it is significant. There's a ton of resources in this document and we're creating more of a, a desktop version. It's actually, I think, at the printers now or soon um, so that we'll be able to really put this in play and there'll be like a version for um, hiring managers to really have it the ready as a check for have they kind of used this in the way that we're seeking to see them use and throughout their hiring processes. Um, we also conduct an audit of our hiring. Um, and this is really a, is a sample audit, but it's to see how the hiring toolkit has impacted the process. We look back to say, okay, did people, you know, did they use questions that help drive toward equity literacy to help understand someone's kind of pedagogy and how they're approaching the work? Did, do, um, did they have a robust committee um, as part of the hiring process, which is key to equity? Um, and then um, another example is um, Barb mentioned the Driving Towards Diversity Project, which was a bar grant that had us work with the New Teacher Project. And that um, did a, a landscape analysis that really helped prioritize where our actions should go. And so the things we're talking about are really all in line with that, which includes the Equity Hiring Toolkit, going deeper around retention, um, expanding affinity groups, and um, other data routines. You can go forward. Um, another key work is around instructional culture. And, you know, we could talk about this from a lot of different angles, but the examples um, I want to share with you are about our work with our leaders, our leadership group, um, which is the equity oriented leadership that started in the summer um, and really is continuing monthly. So that's all principals and assistant principals and district leaders. Um, are are going to be doing this work. And an example of something they're going to do in that professional learning time is something like going deeper on the equity hiring toolkit to really ensure that we have aligned practice um, and move that forward. And then also, um, as we started this summer, is really the work around um, restorative practices and belonging, that it's not just about the safe and equitable schools work with students, it's also about adults. And so going deep around circle practices and what that looks like and how we create that um, has, it, you know, it's really beneficial for the leadership group and also creates templates for them for their work with staff um, that they get to kind of carry forward. Next slide. And then the last thing is around retention. And this is really where um, I'm going to pass the mic to Julia, but we have a number of um, key work happening related to retention. Um, so as a note, the new the, the TNTP grant um, where we did the landscape analysis and, and kind of focus, we had a deep conversation with them about, you know, if we if we only have so much capacity, where do we put our energy? Do we put it in retention? Do we put it in recruitment? Because we know it's all important, right? And we want to do it all and we want to do it all well. And they said, you know, you've got to focus on retention. That's where you start. And then you build towards more of the recruitment. And of course, we of course we have all of these things happening at the same time, but that's why I think this is really important to name as key work and some of the elements that are happening related to that. Um, you know, just like my titles have sort of shifted as the work has evolved in Portland's public schools and now includes the word belonging, it really further elevates that, you know, equity can't happen without belonging. Um, in the in the Paul Gorski framing of the skills and habits of equity literacy, you know, the where you're driving towards is um, cultivating, sustaining and actively cultivating equitable environments. And that that has to have belonging as a part of that. We don't get there without people feeling belonging and inclusion. And so, you know, as as mentioned, we learned from the equity, uh, the educators of color report that, you know, people do experience alienation and isolation among staff teams. And that report helped us to see things that we can do about that. So some of those things are as simple as helping people meaningfully connect as staffs. And some of those are about specific needs like supporting affinity groups for BIPOC and LGBTQ staff. Um, we can deepen our cultures of uh, our school cultures of belonging and inclusion. And we can do that by everyone, by ensuring everyone experiences that feeling of community and inclusion. 
we've all been through a lot in the last few years in this district and in this community. And, you know, people here give such a great deal of themselves to the work. We know that we have to create, um, you know, we know that by creating deeper belonging among staff and places where people are seen and, um, and fully valued for all of what they bring, um, it will further lead to the retention. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Julia Hazel um, to talk more about her work. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Julia Hazel, and I am the director of BIPOC Career Pathways and Leadership Development. And I'm really happy to be here this evening and, and get to share more about all that we're doing, which is really exciting. Um, so um, I think that, you know, imagination has long been a tool of liberation. And that when we think about our BIPOC educator development work, we have to hold a vision of what we're aspiring to. Um, you know, what would it look like to eradicate the racial disparity between our students and teachers? Um, imagine, picture that where every building, half the teachers are people of color, half the administrators are people of color. That's our vision um, where we have that that matching reflection, that matching ratio between students and teachers. Um, we Because we know that whenever there's a racial disparity, it points to systemic racism. Um, and so that those data points can help us to kind of look into the, the root causes. Um, we know that research shows that having BIPOC teachers benefits both white and BIPOC students. Um, we also know, particularly from the Educators of Color Insights report, that diversifying the staff benefits our staff members as well. Um, you know, and so while we hold this vision in our minds, we also, um, shorter term, set more specific goals and targets. Um, so um, we're currently at 9% of our teachers are BIPOC. Um, and then our goal is looking ahead to 2030 that 18% of our teachers will be. If you go to the next slide, Erin, um, this gives a little context for that. So this is again from, um, this is from the Bar Foundation. So with our work with TNTP, they shared this with us and it, it shows um, what the percentages are for Southern New England states as well as um, an overall national percentage. Um, and so you can see that in Southern New England, the percent, the average percent of BIPOC teachers is under 10%. Um, and so PPS already um, is matching Connecticut. Um, and we know that Portland exceeds much of Maine, um, but we're still lagging far behind actually representing the students in our schools. Um, so when we look at that national average of 18% of teachers BIPOC, we set our sights on that um, because um, we think that's attainable by 2030. Um, if you look at the next slide, this helps to show what our trend has been. Um, and so let's start with teachers. So teachers are the, the red line is the um, those on the PEA contract, including all of our teachers. And um, it has um, the clearest linear trend line. So you can see, um, as Barb mentioned, in the past six years, we've tripled the number of PEA educators who identify as BIPOC. Um, and based on this model, we can project that if the trend continues, um, as it has been, which is an increase of about 1% each year, um, that we would be at 16% BIPOC teachers by 2030. However, we are convinced that with the targeted retention and recruitment work that we're doing, that we can exceed that rate of increase so that we're matching that 18% national average by 2030. So you can see that black dot hovering above the red line indicates that 18% goal. So it would be slightly above the trend that we've seen across the past six years because we know that we're increasing our capacity um, and we're becoming more strategic about this work. Um, looking now at the um, 
at the blue points, those are data points for our ed techs, um, specifically the percentage of BIPOC ed techs. Um, and so you can see that um, we had an increase from around from 14%. And then the last three years, that nut figure has stayed at about one fourth of our ed techs identify as BIPOC. Um, and then looking at the yellow line that tracks our PAA administrators, um, those on the PAA contract. Um, and this is not really, you, that trend line would be like an average, but if you look at the data points, you can see that what we've seen is like, we held steady with 3%, which was one BIPOC principal. Um, then we had two for one year, and then this year it shot up and we have six BIPOC um, folks on the PAA contract. Um, so we, we hope to continue to see that rate grow. Um, so going forward, um, one of the things that uh, TNTP really brought to our attention was the fact that if we want to be, um, if we want to be able to see our progress um, towards these staff diversity goals, then we have to be collecting data points um, consistently um, and purposefully. Um, and so we've had a lot of conversations um, with um, Gavin and Bay on our data team, as well as with the folks from TNTP and BAR, um, and came up with these data points that we will collect going forward. Up until this point, the data that we've collected is what you saw on the um, previous slide. Okay. So um, the creation of my role has really expanded our capacity as a district to support our BIPOC staff development in many ways. Um, and I wanna take the opportunity to say what, um, what a privilege and an honor it is um, to get to be in this position um, and to be responsive to the needs of our BIPOC individuals and community while also being strategic about the systems change that will make Portland Public Schools a place BIPOC educators thrive. So in numbers, this shows um, how many staff members I reached during my work during last year, uh, the last school year. Um, so 101 staff members, um, 101 BIPOC staff members, that represents um, just around two thirds of our BIPOC staff members. Um, and so the it's, it's hard to see, but each of those columns represents um, one of our sites. And then the numbers at the top are the number of um, staff members from that site who I had contact with. So this includes, um, this reflects staff who attended BIPOC drop-ins for support with applying to positions or applying for certification or getting advice on registering for courses um, or any other issue. It includes people attending BIPOC social gatherings, those who attended mutual support and healing sessions with um, Blanca Santiago, a social worker who we contract to support that. Um, it includes those who I stopped by at their school site and visited with or who made individual appointments with me. And I will say that that was 101. Um, those are separate individuals. So some of those people I met with multiple times. Um, so I also, this spring, um, Roy Chatterjee um, worked as an assistant with me half time and that it enabled us to proactively reach out and make contact with all of our BIPOC ed techs and talk with them about their experience, their skills and their career pathway interests. I wanted to share these quotes as well as the pictures that you've seen throughout because they're the real faces of our staff members. Um, and I think it's important to, to bring it to life so it's, it's less abstract. Um, this work um, that we're doing really was driven or is driven by the voices of our BIPOC staff that we were able to capture in our Educators of Color Insight Report. And those voices continue to guide our path. So um, 
in all of my work. It's I, I, I'm listening to, I'm gathering and all of those interactions. I'm gathering from people information about their experiences and taking it back and putting it together to consider what are the patterns that were that are emerging um, and what are the systemic shifts that we can make um, to make our district um, more and more inclusive, um, more and more anti-racist. So <clears throat> one of the things that we anticipated um, and that did become even more clear after talking with almost all of our BIPOC ed techs is that our ed techs want to become teachers and have experiences and skills that will make them valuable assets on our teaching staff. Um, we also know um, that as we saw before, a high percentage, 25, about 25% of our um, ed techs are BIPOC. Um, and so these factors, and I should also mention that in that experience, a lot of our BIPOC ed techs previously taught in other countries. So these factors um, make supporting a transition from ed tech to teacher a really strong internal recruitment strategy. And that adds to what Barb was saying, you know, these are already people who really know um, our schools, our students who um, have gained, um, you know, are committed and invested in the work that we're doing already. So this title, um, can you go back actually? Thank you. Um, Elevating Educators. Um, is an initiative that I started to develop during the 2021 to 2022 school year and continue building. Um, the program development and initial funding has largely been provided by the grant we received from the New Schools Venture Fund. Um, and so the graphic in this logic model for the program um, is a metaphor. Um, my mind likes to use metaphors. And what I was thinking when I was conceiving of this program that's going to support, create a really supportive pathway to help ed techs transition into teaching roles, um, that it was not that we were adding things to the ed techs to make them be able to be in this different role. What we're really doing is if you can see the river, um, filled with some obstacles. Um, you can imagine um, stones and branches making passage down that river difficult. Um, and it's our work as the school district to remove the structural barriers that make it challenging for BIPOC um, ed techs and any ed tech, white ed techs as well, to advance in their careers if, they, if that's something that they wish to do. Um, and so um, some of the ways that we've begun to remove those obstacles include um, helping people understand the complicated system of teacher certification, um, providing additional course funding to help people afford the courses that are required for degree completion or for certification to be able to do it on a timeline even more accelerated than what's been funded historically through the contractual course reimbursement. Um, expanding and revising our hiring committee training materials, which we've mentioned, um, and doing the work to make the environment in our schools welcoming and inclusive um, so that people are valued for what they bring um, and will want to stay when they do make that transition. So um, there's a lot of partnerships that are helping to make this possible, and I just want to highlight a few of them, which include Portland Adult Education, their Educators Academy, um, USM, EMCC, um, UMaine Farmington, and then funding from the Alfond Foundation and New Schools Venture Fund. So the next slide um, shows a little bit more of kind of the process for what elevating educators would look like and how it's taking shape. Um, and so on the left um, are some entry points where ed techs can begin their growth. We've done some surveys and learned that Overwhelmingly, ed techs really want more professional development. Um, and so that inclusion in the new contract in multiple ways is really significant. Um, and um, so, and I just want to uh, guess say explicitly that 
Elevating Educators is a program that will be open to white and BIPOC um, ed techs. Um, so the Eastern Maine Community College program is another huge entry point. Um, it is an accelerated program that has allowed um, staff members with fewer than 90 college credits to accelerate to an EdTech 3 certification, which enables them to um, earn higher pay and gain really on um, practical um, training. Um, and then on the right side, you can see kind of the three tiers of how the program would support people um, with the idea that people would start in that tier one after they have at least an associate's degree or 60 credits, um, and then would move into tier two and tier three. And so for this coming school year, tiers one and tiers three are really um, fleshed out. And in the next school year, we'll, we'll be fleshing out tier two. Um, and so then this is um, a breakdown of the source, the funding sources and the different um, ways we've been using funding to build all these program components that you've heard about tonight. Um, and you can see that um, for this year that the, the district has committed a substantial amount of money for this um, coming school year. Um, and that that has also been, um, will be almost um, more than matched by grant funding. Um, the grants include, as I've mentioned, the Alphon Foundation, Bar Foundation, the New Schools Venture Fund, and some title money. Um, so our, our hope is that we can maintain that that um, the board will maintain and extend the commitment that you've already shown to our um, staff diversity efforts um, so we can continue to deepen and grow this work. So um, as we close, um, as Julia just elevated, um, it, it feels familiar to when I started in 2017, where a great deal of our work was funded by grants. Um, and while we've had great success um, funding projects with grants, we know there'll be additional needs identified um, by the work that will that it is what it will take to make PPS the place that continues to attract and retain incredible educators. Um, We've made these investments because they because they've become increasingly clear to us, and as elevated in this presentation, the return on investment um, is is um, uh, pretty representative. So um, we are continuing to follow the research of what about what benefits students, and uh, as well as staff, and um, look forward to continuing that work with all of you. So we're happy to take questions um, if you happen to have any. Thank you so much, Barrett and Julia and Barb and to the full team. I'm wondering how you did, did you actually put together these scrap, this Scrabble yeah. board? Um, yes, <laughs> this was from an activity that uh, sort of defied some of the rules of Scrabble. As you'll see, there's <laughs> some very long words there, um, including facilitator and efficacious. Um, <laughs> that was part of a uh, leadership team builder. Very well done. <laughs> okay, uh, it was from my team. We won by a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you clarified that. I'm not that. sure that everybody agreed that that was the <laughs> we definitely won. Okay, are there questions from the board? Uh, Ms. Bryden, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much for all that uh, information. Uh, it's exciting work. Um, I have a question um, that is coming from a place of curiosity, not challenge. Um, the the uh, I absolutely understand that you can't do everything all at the same time. Like we would love to do like all what two, three, four, like eight things. All it's, yeah, that'd be super, but we can't. Um, can you talk a little bit about the choice to go with selection before recruitment? Just uh, the way my brain works, I would think recruitment and then select. Just can you talk about that? Yeah, you want to jump in too? Yeah. So when we first started this, we we were thinking about getting people into the pipeline and getting people through the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so we basically had the, the choice of figuring that out. Yeah. Our recruitment, so recruitment has changed so much <laughs> in a de-education field. We never had a problem filling our pools, you know, yeah. at all. And 
we had done very little recruitment outside the district, outside the state. And so we had done some sporadic, um, which is really not the way to be doing that kind of recruitment. And so we also didn't have a lot of money to travel. You know, so we, we ended up saying, you know what, let's look at the inside piece first. And that was why we chose basically the equity hiring toolkit to really look at the internal processes and get people trained up on that before we started to look at getting people into the pipeline. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Braden. Ms. Lentz. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to uh, just say thank you to all of you who just did that presentation. Uh, I think, um, you know, in diversity and equity work, we often just hear about people trying to implement checklists or um, just getting to the end product so quickly that the humanness of the people around them are lost. And I just think that the processes that you're talking about are just so um, uh, indicative of how much you're caring holistically for everybody that's in our uh, district. And I, I just really want to thank you for that. And I think that 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 approach is really going to help us in the long term. Um, so I just, I feel tremendously proud of this work and I feel tremendously proud to see where it's going to go and what we can continue to learn and just feel tremendously grateful for all of your leadership. Um, and my question in this is, um, with the net promoter score, is it possible to disaggregate that data at all by race? We do not have the information by race. We can basically break it down um, to building level and by building level and district okay. office, but we don't have um, the other, that level of um, disaggregation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lentz. Ms. Bando. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. My first question already been asked, so I get the, the answer. And I think, uh, just stay with me. I have a couple of questions here. Um, I think from the short to understand what you mentioned, what, how do you uh, address your bias in your, in your hiring process and uh, using that one in your toolkit, you know, to make sure then, you know, what we do, the, because when you look at the bias, you see the implicit and the explicit. So how do you use that one? How do you see that and addressing that one as a tool for the hiring process? Then you can audit and make sure then we're doing the right thing. Uh, fantastic question, Mickey. Um, and it's certainly not just one thing. Um, so the way we talk about it when we're orienting people to the to the toolkit is that you know bias can enter the process in hiring in in a variety of points, from how we word a job description to who makes up a hiring committee to the questions they're asking. Um, and so we're you know the toolkit is really trying to think about it throughout the process. What are the different things that we can put in place that help to mitigate bias? Right. We're still you have a brain, you have bias. Um, that's part of the human experience, but we really do want to put in place some things that address the ways in which hiring, uh, you know, benefits some people over others um, because of the ways in which institutional racism and sexism and homophobia, you know, like the ways in which those things play out. So, um, so it's it's certainly a lot of tools that are part of that toolkit. So an example would be um, we're moving towards competence, competency based hiring. Right. So we're not trying to hire just by like, you know, we're going to ask these 10 questions of every candidate and and whoever answers them the best is our candidate. It's really to move towards saying, what are what are the skills and um, that we really need to see in this position, whatever is the position? And then you know, we ask questions that help get at that, but there's other components of a hiring process too. So sometimes there's performance tasks, uh, people submit resumes and cover letters. Sometimes they do, you know, some other sort of uh, assignment as part of hiring. Maybe we're looking at a lesson plan, you know, that sort of thing. All of that factors in so that, you know, we're not just assessing it on, you know, how well someone answered a question. It's more about what skills and attributes really are they bringing to the table? So um, it's a it's a massive tool um, and there's a lot to it, um, but we are trying to think about it at, you know, at all of those stages in the hiring process to address bias. Okay. Great. Thank you. That makes sense to me. Thank you. Very much. And my second one is that I remember when we, we've been building the equity policy, I think the, 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 the professional development was mostly on the on the uh, the cultural inclusion, and so I look at your instru uh, instructional culture. Then the picture you just mentioned, people meeting and the uh, East End, 
uh, those are required or optional to choose. And then it's done by affinity group or just a random of uh, teacher staff coming together. Um, so it's, it's a whole mix. So we have our affinity group offerings um, are optional. Um, they're opt in. Um, occasionally, those have happened within larger professional developments, like Wednesday afternoon professional developments with a with a option to meet in a breakout group with a identity based affinity group. Um, but more, most of the BIPOC affinity group options are optional after school. Um, um, and then, in terms of the professional development, like for ed techs that I mentioned, um, those are. Um, mostly the work has been around what, what additional offerings that would be optional can we provide? And then also how can we compensate ed techs for, for, um, more of those? All right. Thank you. So for the restorative practices, I'm kind of a little curious to try to understand how we're using those restorative practices on some specific issues or challenges. Can you go over a little bit if it's about uh, exclusion, discrimination, or something about trauma? So what's those kind of bigger issues that we have to use the restorative practice in, the, in, in that specific zone or court or pool of teachers or BIPOC? Yeah, I wouldn't say, you know, in, in terms of what I was presenting related to restorative, it's really, it's, it's, it's building everyone's foundational skills mm -hmm. around community building practices okay. that relate to restorative practices. I so see. circles, things like that. You know, I think there's a lot to be said about the use of restorative practices in, in lots of settings. But as I was speaking about it, that was really about the work that we're doing um, with leadership teams and staff teams mm -hmm. to, to help build that kind of foundational practice right. um, towards our goals of, of safe and equitable schools. Thank you for that clarification. I think that's going to be for Julia. I have observed he, he, the trend that you just showed, I think, earlier about the educator of color. The trend is kind of a little low. I think it's 9% versus two others. So on your observation, since you've been here, what did you see the most issues for retaining the, the BIPOC educator? Um, so the the focus on belonging and inclusion right. this year um, and the decision to make that the a, a theme that we return to and um, embed in all of our leadership professional development came out of um, listening to BIPOC staff last year um, and specifically hearing stories of um, BIPOC staff who entered teaching roles and were encountering um, racialized harm okay. um, that played out like exclusion, um, othering, um, undermining, and a recognition also that um, in broader school cultures, there's, there's um, a lot of need for repair and building up because the pandemic has really taken a toll. Um, and I think um, when we center the voices of our BIPOC um, educators and work to, to listen and kind of responsively change our school cultures to make them more inclusive, that brings everybody in um, and, and, and makes that culture feel um, welcoming for all. Thank you. So we still have a lot to do. Yes. Yeah. It's, I mean, I will say it's that no it was the heaviest thing that I, I took from last year yeah. was feeling like getting people into college classes is relatively concrete. Yes. Um, changing the culture in our schools is much bigger and messier and harder. Yes. Um, so I feel encouraged that I, I think the steps we're taking this year are going to start to turn the ship mm -hmm. um, and it will take, you know, staying the course. All right. Thank you. And almost done with my question. So this is the one I just look at here, the way our staff across the district. So I see, this is my observation and I want to see if something is because, because when I look at most of the BIPOC educators are mostly uh, uh on the diverse schools here, more than 10, mostly like uh, East End School, Ocean Avenue and uh, Deering High School. Those are 
is just because we need we need more diversified teaching on that area or was just uh, and that is that is the the data there are the people that um Julia engaged with directly. Oh, okay. So yeah. it's not necessarily that that's the number of people, yeah. but I do think that your general um, question is also accurate that, you know, the schools with larger um, BIPOC uh, uh, student populations tend to have more BIPOC staff. I don't think that that is universally true, but I think that you see some of that represented in, okay. in the number of people that so is there is a reason behind that? Because why we don't have a more BIPOC teachers or educator and long fellow example? That's just something that I just wonder if just so, that's a need or we don't need or is a. I mean, well, there's there's a lot embedded there, but I would say that that like Javier was saying that 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 graph is showing the number of people that I met yes, with, I guess. and so. Um, the schools that have more BIPOC right. staff, you mm -hmm. know, I met with more people. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, we have the fact that we still have some schools that do not have BIPOC staff. You know, we know that all students, white students, BIPOC students all benefit from having a diverse staff. So I think it is it is something that I'm looking at and noticing um, because I do think um, we it's not there are schools that have high percentage, sorry, there are schools that have higher percentages of BIPOC staff currently. Um, and a question I have is how does that affect the pace at which the school culture changes um, to be more inclusive? Um, and what, you know, other questions that I'm asking are, you know, what are some of the moves that our school leaders are doing that make schools feel inclusive for BIPOC educators? Yeah. Um, and what um, how do we, you know, how do we, again, it, it is connected to recruitment. How do we end retention is those schools that have few or no BIPOC staff members, how do we encourage people to apply and then make it an appealing place to stay and then build towards, um, you know, a more representative proportion. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's true. So my last question is about the ed tech moving to the, to the, to the teaching position, you know, the last presentation the last slide just mentioned uh try to understand your outputs here put some some numbers those are the target numbers on the i'm in, just not sure which slide elevating education oh in the center box yes yes so those are kind of goals for number of participants in the different tiers okay mm -hmm. the one we have now we, we want to targeting so um and i don't remember what it shows thank you very um, 25 on tier one. So like for 25 educators in tier one, this year we have 20 educators in that tier. So those are BIPOC only or white and BIPOC combined? It is, it's combined. Okay. Um, right now, um, and I don't, I don't have for you the percent of <laughs> BIPOC and white right now in, in, enrolled in those courses. I could get that for you. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I can, I can easily get that for you. Right. Um, and then. Like I said, tier two, we really haven't um, launched yet. Right. So that's a goal for the following school year. Mm -hmm. um, and then 10 educators in tier three. Um, we have eight educators in tier three right. this year. All right. That's good to know. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we still have a lot to do, but that's, that's a start. That's... Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm done with my question, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Bondo. Ms. Russell Better. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to give a huge kudos and share gratitude um, for all of your leadership, the superintendent's leadership, Barb's leadership, Barrett and Julia, and just um, the incredible work that's happened over the years. I just wanted to reflect on um, starting to become a parent in Portland schools in 2014. And I just feel like every year, and if I think about the last couple of years, just being able to actually see in action the changes happening. And, you know, it always seems like it's slow and it can be slow, but, you know, I can look back and and, and think of my, my daughters, the impact on their education um, and their two school communities um, due to 
to more BIPOC staff and um, admin in their buildings, and and certainly kids in our community the impact. But I know directly my own my own students and and what they say to me about um, the adults that are in their lives and how that's changed. The diversity has changed in their school community. So I just want to say like getting to see that that's huge. It's impacting students every day. So I just want to say getting to see that. And I know that's happening in all the other school communities, but those are the ones that, you know, I've intimately seen. Um, so I just want to thank, thank you. I was just like on the edge of my seat, listening to this whole presentation and just, um, I'm in awe of this work. And I, I just wanted to point out, you know, what, what Julie is doing with those one-on-one -on -one uh, uh, meetings is just incredible, like that relationship building and people just share, you know, staff sharing, feeling seen and that sense of belonging that clearly staff has illustrated to us that they weren't having. So just the, the start of that work and, and how you just described really the messiness of, of changing culture, like that's huge. I mean, we have the concrete staff shifting, changing and the goal over time, it's wonderful, but also those nebulous pieces of culture and um, belonging are huge. And I just so appreciate the thoughtful um, steps that clearly um, everyone's taking to, to, to put those changes in place. So um, yeah, I just wanted to reflect on really seeing the, the concrete change and just, I'm so thrilled. Um, I just had a question about, um, I think Barrett, when you were talking about equity audit, I was just curious because I was thinking how you know, like the staff hiring, obviously we can see that some changes happen, right? Like from doing the committee, you know, looking at the committees that are hiring the toolkit. I mean, you can see um, that, that that's, that's beneficial, right? Because people are getting hired and that's changing over time. I was just curious if you could share anything about, um, you know, how is that information shared or what's been helpful with the audits to show the findings of like what's working or not, or um, just curious kind of what comes of those and how does that come back to the buildings or like, how does that? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's something that I want to, uh, you know, integrate more fully. Um, I think that's a little bit of a casualty of COVID um, mm. in the last couple of years because hiring's just been so different and, and we need to catch up on what the rhythms are. So like in theory, you know, we do a hiring audit sometime over the summer from the whole last year, or we do it a couple times during the year to kind of evaluate like what happened summer through fall and then what happened in the spring. You know, and I think um, Julia and I have had some good conversations about how we want to how we want to do that, along with um, you know looking at some of those data points that uh, were in her presentation. Um, so, but that is the goal is to kind of look back. So we've had you know in in the second year of implementation of that equity hiring toolkit, I was able to kind of share with administrators, we know we've done a little bit of an audit. Here's what we saw. And initially, you know, very good results. Mm -hmm. I, I would say just a little trickier during, you know, COVID years where it's like we're, we're hiring remotely and like, you know, diff people had to get better at it. Um, I think we've got some great practices in, in place now that allow us to do both remote and in-person hiring and, you know, some other things we're, we're working on. But um you know, initially we were able to see like, okay, this, you know, this, you know, we would sort of sample audit. It wouldn't matter what the process was. It was like, okay, for this process, they, you know, they were, they used these questions. I can see there was a very robust committee. We could, we could get a sense of like, did the committee represent, you know, different identities and roles? Um, you know, we would have a little bit of a sense of sometimes, um, and that's what we really want to see. Um, happening. So um, Barb and I really um, would set forth kind of goals that we wanted to see come from the equity hiring toolkit. Um, and, and we were kind of checking against those. And so that's what we'll do moving forward is kind of continue to say, okay, these are our priorities with, with, you know, our, our, our hiring work. Um, at some point, we'll just, we will stop calling it equity hiring work. We'll just call it hiring work because that's what it is. Um, and we will, you know, we'll kind of measure against those like priorities um, because there's always room to get better. That makes sense. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I just wanted to say, I appreciated the explanation about retention first, because I, I, that makes a lot of sense to me that we're doing everything right. Recruiting and um, hiring, but that the folks that we have here, we want, you know, I see that they're pieces you're putting in place constantly to say, how do we keep good people here and Absolutely. that they feel a sense of community and belonging. Um, so just the last thing I wanted to say, I just appreciate Julia, you bringing back 
this work to our role as a board. And I just want to say enthusiastically yes to myself. And I think I can probably speak for many of us that yes, you know, everything you're sharing, I'm so glad that, you know, we're, we're able to um, have a role in continuing to fund and support the work. So I just want to say, uh, just hearing all of this makes me even more excited to enthusiastically support um, in our budget to continue the work you're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Russell-Better. Mr. Burke. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks for the excellent presentation and um, work that you are doing. I um, just want to reflect a couple of things. One, to uh, Barb, thank you for one of the best explanations of the Net Promoter Score that <laughs> I've gone through here. And as highlighted, the Educator of Color report really provided the qualitative information in terms of what wasn't working or why someone wouldn't recommend working in Portland public schools and just to continue highlighting how powerful having that body of information is for us to have actionable insights into what we can do. And I'm glad that we have it in this context. Um, I also just want to hold up that I know that this work and we're seeing positive results uh, in what was shown here today for Portland public schools, but I was just talking with someone today about the impact that this work's had at the University of Southern Maine. I know that, you know, there, there's been the sharing of this, the, the equity hiring toolkit and other um, learnings and, and tools that we've developed with other school districts and just this has a positive effect in the region and in the state as well. So thank you for all that you're doing and your willingness to share it with others that are trying to do good work day after day as well. And that's all for me. Thank you, Board Member Burke. Are there other questions from the board? Okay, I'll just say, first I wanted to um, say thank you to Barb. Um, uh, it's very hard to see you go. I don't, um, especially during COVID, it was hard to understand how you were getting so much done constantly. Um, I am yeah, just in awe of, of all that you do and have done for the district. And um, I'm so deeply appreciative. And, and now you're going, <laughs> you're going to serve on the superintendent search committee. So I really, um, that is a gift to us on the board. And um, I look forward to working with you in that capacity. And thank you so much for all that you've done over nine and a half years. Um, I, uh, some of my questions were answered. Um, I do want to just echo the appreciation um, in particular to Julia for the individual meetings that you're doing. That to me um, really just stands out as, um, as connecting with people and addressing people's humanity and then uh, how we, you know, one critical way to develop belonging in a, in just such a different way than I think, we typically go about things because it's hard. Those those meetings, I know, it must be incredibly time intensive to set up and do. Just want to acknowledge that. I think for me, um, I I'm so um, optimistic about the restructuring of our people's apartment. No, do we call it a department now? Of our people structure, people work. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, I think it, it, we're at the perfect point to make this transition where you're doing the, the HR, HR transactional piece as one piece and then the other work um, that Barrett. Um, so grateful to see you heading up um, in terms of the diversity, equity, and belonging work. So just want to um, recognize what an important structural shift we're making. And I think um, uh, flowing from all of the cultural um, shifting that we're trying to do and recognizing how hard that is. Um, I guess the question I had both for Barrett and for Julia is, do you have the tools you need to be successful and what do you see coming down um, the road in terms of what you might need to make this work um, more successful? What a great question that I'm not fully prepared for. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I would say, you know, there's so much to it, but I'm feeling um, similarly excited about the restructuring and what having that you know, this new kind of organization of teams be able to vision. And, you know, I just want to say that I think it's also really key that, you know, the 
de the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Belonging, how closely that's going to interface with the operations department is really going to be key um, to, to make all of that kind of real and come to fruition. Um, so, I mean, I think um, some of it's new to be able to answer that question. Um, I wonder what Julia is thinking. She's had a few more seconds while I've been <laughs> trying to get her thoughts. Um, yes. Well, one of the things I think that I feel excited about is that as we've been expanding this work and making it more visible, the kinds of supports to people, I think we're going to continue to see people responding to what's being offered and seeing like more people wanting to participate. So I can anticipate wanting um, additional um, staff support, uh, like especially for that like recruit recruiting um, topic. Um, when I think about um, that holistic care for people, um, mental health support is big and funding. Um, we've been able to fund um, small contracts over the past couple years to um, for with BIPOC social workers and therapists to do one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions um, with BIPOC staff. So that's something I'd like to see expand. One of our pathways is... Um, from as a part of elevating educators is for ed techs who want BIPOC ed techs who want to become social workers. We have a dearth of BIPOC social workers in Portland schools. Um, we currently have one full-time BIPOC social worker. Um, and so we are doing, uh, we're um, piloting a program with two of our BIPOC um, ed techs who are currently in their, in the, social work master's program at USM to um, fund a half-time release so that they can do their field work um, for their second year at um, the elementary school that they work at, which is um, a win-win-win because it's um, enabling people to um, do that social work field work as part of their work day instead of on top of a work day. Um, it's providing additional social work support to the school. Um, and so I would love to see, I envision that program expanding and us having like two people entering every year with a total of eight people in that four-year program um, and supporting field work for years two and year four. Um, so those are some of the big things on my mind as I look forward. Also, I'll say... Um, just people's excitement about being able to take courses and to accelerate, especially those of our ed techs who haven't completed their BA or for a lot of our ed techs who are immigrants who are not able to access their transcripts and so have to um, basically earn another degree in the U.S. right now um, as things stand. Um, there's a real energy and momentum to people wanting to take courses faster than um, the rate that, you know, we previously funded. And, and I want to make that possible. Excellent. Thank you Thank so much you for asking that. Yeah. And um, please just, we, I, I think, you know, I, I'll speak for myself, but I want this work to be successful. So please come continue to come to us. And when it comes to budget season, we want to make sure that, um, the work that you just articulated in terms of some of the next steps are included in our budget. Okay, I'm going to hand it back to the superintendent. Yep, thank you. Um, so thanks to the entire team. Um, I do want to just take a moment to, to recognize that um, even though he wasn't up there, that um, Terry's position is also pivotal in our ability to make this transition. And the work that he's doing leading all of our operational departments is critical to our ability to continue this. But I certainly feel that... Um, you know, I'm encouraged that we have achieved everything that we've achieved in this area. And, you know, people is definitely a foundation. And I feel really, really confident that the team that we have um, with uh, Julia, with Barrett, with Terry, with Chris um, is going to enable us to be able to um, continue the amazing work that really has been the work of Barb Stoddard. And so as um, you know, as Barb um, steps away, I um, cannot begin to recognize how important she's been to the work that we've been doing um, for the duration of my tenure. 
from day one, Barb embraced the challenge of realizing our people goal. Uh, she was particularly passionate about advancing our diversity. Um, and as you can see in America's whitest state, our staff diversity has increased significantly where we sit today looking at having met our original goal and in a position to continue to move this work forward with the ambitious goals that you heard today. Um, to achieve this, Barb has worked tirelessly. Um, the level of customer service from our HR department <clears throat> has consistently been highlighted by our school leaders as an example of successful central office supports. And this is before I started just, you know, right off the bat because of the work that Barb did uh, when she became the, um, the HR director. Uh, she's negotiated upwards of a dozen collective bargaining agreements, um, always understanding that building strong relationships with our collective bargaining units was central to creating a strong system of support for our people. But it isn't just the system's work. Um, it's above all personal engagement. Barb has personally helped countless staff members to weather challenges that would have kept them from initial or continued employment. Um, she's gotten deep in the weeds um, because of her commitment and understanding that this is people work and it requires supporting people wherever they need that support. Um, there are dozens of people, if not more, um, I don't know what comes after dozens, um, in Portland schools who would not be here, but for her personal dedication to their situations. Um, it was Barb's vision and commitment to improvement that brought us to the Educator of Color report. When Dora Santoro approached her, it would have been uh, super easy to say, sure, have at it. Actually, you know, um, it would have also been easy to try to stall it. But Barb not only sponsored the work, but she found the means to support bringing Julia and Alberto Morales, who, as you know, um, is currently one of our APs at Portland High School, but was a Casco um, high school teacher at the time, to work directly with Doris on the project. And then she rallied all of our leadership team around the findings, uh, painful as they were, um, and has been committed to seeing the recommendations brought forward to the board and subsequently operationalized, as you heard today. Um, this work has received recognition that includes publicity and funding at the local, state, and national level, and none of it would have been possible without Barb's determination and commitment. Barb will continue to do um, work for us to whatever extent we can get her to do work for us. Um, definitely during this transition, um, and she remains a community leader and will be serving, as you heard, on the superintendent search committee. And I can't think of a, you know, more important um, uh, aspect to continuing that work than um, being a leader in that area. Um, so, Barb, thank you for your friendship, um, your leadership, and above all, for your commitment to Portland Public Schools. I'll miss you, and I know that we all will miss you, and that we're forever grateful for having the opportunity to work with you. We actually do have the framed, famous <laughs> picture. So here we go. That's it. <laughs> All right. So I think as is very appropriate yeah. to close out our meeting, we're on to personnel items. <laughs> Bask in your glory there. <laughs> <laughs> Consideration and action to approve the personnel items listed. Election of one year only teachers. Is there a motion? Ms. Bondo, seconded by Ms. Lentz. Ms. Stoddard, would you like to speak to the motion? Certainly. So tonight we have one one year only that we're bringing forward for approval and three regular teacher positions for your approval. Thank you so much. Are there any questions on the motion? Can I just check on Zoom, seeing none, and there's no public comment on personnel items. Is there any board discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, please indicate whether you support approving the personnel item listed, election of one year only teacher. Mr. Superintendent, will you please call the roll? Yes, Chair, Ms. Bondo? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Burke? Yes. Ms. Russell Better? Yes. Ms. Bryden? Yes. 
Ms. Lentz? Yes. Mr. Grant? Yes. Ms. Dew? Yes. And Chair Figdor? Yes. So the personal item is unanimously approved with our student voting with the majority. And now we're on to consideration and action to approve the personnel items li listed, election of teacher candidates probationary. Ms. Stoddard already spoke to this motion. Is uh, Let me actually first, is there a motion? Ms. Russell Better, is there a second? Mr. Grant. Okay. Um, so Ms. Stoddard already spoke to the motion. Are there any questions on the motion? Seeing none, there's no public comment on personnel items. We'll move to board discussion. Is there any board discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, please indicate whether you approve the personnel items listed, election of teacher candidates, probationary. Mr. Superintendent, will you please call the roll? Yes, Chair. Uh, Ms. Bondo? Yes. Mr. Burke? Yes. Ms. Russell Better? Yes. Ms. Bryden? Yes. Ms. Lentz? Yes. Mr. Grant? Yes. Ms. Dew? Yes. And Chair Figger? Yes. So the personnel item is unanimously approved with the, our student voting with the majority. And that brings our meeting to an end. Um, our next meeting is in November. Um, it's November 1st. November 1st. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Um, at 6 p.m. and we'll we'll meet in this blended format at Casco Bay and uh, on Zoom. Is there a motion to adjourn? Ms. Bryden, there a second. Ms. Russell Better, all in favor with a show of hands. It's unanimous and we are adjourned at 8.06 p.m. <laughs>